Hello, and welcome to Dartmouth-Hitchcock's Heads Up Coping Through COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Audra Burns, Media Relations Manager at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and your moderator for this webinar series. Today, we embark on the second conversation with Dartmouth-Hitchcock experts to discuss the challenges and dramatic changes as a result of COVID-19. I want to remind viewers that questions for our experts can be sent to social at hitchcock.org in advance or comment in the thread below. If we do not get to your questions in the 15 minutes allotted for this program, our experts will answer them on a FAQ page on our website. Today I'm joined by Dr. Kimberly Gifford, a pediatrician at Children's Hospital at Dartmouth Hitchcock, and Susan Pullen, a licensed clinical social worker at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Thank you, Kimberly and Susan, for joining us today for this very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So now with, with sports and other activities on hold, how can children be spending their time at home? How should they be spending their time at home? That's a great question, Audra, and one that we're talking about a lot in my house these days with my 10 and 13 year old daughters. And so I think there's a lot of uncertainty around us and having a schedule or flow to your day can really be helpful to have something that you do have control over. So what should be in that schedule? I like to think about nurturing the mind and the body and the soul all at the same time or all throughout your day. So nurturing the mind with schoolwork and other creative outlets, nurturing the body by being physically active, stretching, getting your heart pumping, maybe going out for a walk with your kids to get some fresh air and nurturing the soul with anything your kids enjoy. Maybe for me, it's knitting. I like to spend a lot of time doing that, but each kid's different in the things they enjoy. Some social time, some self-care. So putting all these things together um, is a little bit of an art and something that kids actually can learn a lot from thinking about their body's natural rhythms. When's a good time to exercise? When should they hit the books? And how to schedule breaks in throughout that time. My daughter actually asked me to mention that um, adolescent sleep cycles shift a bit during adolescence, whereas kids want to stay up a bit later and sleep in in the morning. And normally school doesn't allow that to happen. But now schools are starting a little bit later and kids actually can safely stay up a little bit later at night. Um, so you can feel free to do that. I think it's just really great how kids are learning how to manage their schedules rather than having things dictated to that. And so this is a great time to practice that adaptability and learn these life skills rather than um, focusing solely on the schoolwork and whatnot. I completely agree, Kim. And, you know, when we think about routines and um, schedule, I also think about the space that we, we keep our schedules in and, and now how our homes are becoming offices and schools and uh, places that we're, we're attempting to also be social beings. And um, I was thinking about how as a former teacher, um, the classroom is a space that was, is really set up for connecting, creating, engaging and having access to the things that, that we enjoy um, so that we know um, that when we do have time to do that fun thing, take a break, we know where to find our stuff. Um, so I think thinking about also how we set up our space um, so that you know, if we're gonna try board games or something new and different, they're not buried in a chest somewhere, they're, they're out and about, the knitting is on the couch, the books are in a pile that is accessible. And just sort of thinking about how the space is inviting, if we want to communicate, is, is the dining room table cleared off for the family meal so that we can connect and eat together? I think that's a great idea, you know, reconfiguring your space. So normally as parents, we want to put everything away, but, but why not have the activities out? That's a great idea. And that, and that sleep, what you were mentioning about sleep, Kim, I have a seventh grader and, you know, I've had to be able to make that adjustment. So I'm glad you said that it's okay because he's been going <laughs> to bed at 11, sleeping till like nine. So thank you for that. Um, so since we're spending, you know, a lot of time at home together and our kids are really observing how we manage this changing situation, how should parents approach modeling those skills? I think that, you know, right now, parents are just juggling a lot of things. Some of us are working too much. Some of us may be worried that we're working too little. Um, some of us may have financial worries. We may be seeing our kids struggle. We may worry about our health, our loved ones. We have a lot going on. This is a really stressful time. And so it's a good time to be patient with ourselves and our kids. And um, so in addition to, you know, modeling, keeping a schedule and self-care, I think, you know, just really increasing our self-awareness, what is going on? And um, you know, some of us may be noticing that, that um, we're experiencing anxiety or depression or 
um, that maybe this is a time when misusing substances may be a greater risk for us. And so recognizing when we as adults need to call in supports, whether that's the informal support of trusted family and friends or reaching out to our own physicians or mental health professionals. Uh, we're lucky that we have a family support warm line in the area. Um, it's 1-800-640-6486. So I think recognizing if as an adult, um, we need to reach out and, and ask for help. Susan, I really like your juggling analogy. I'm actually learning to juggle. That's one of the things my kids are teaching me while I'm home. So I know I've sure dropped a lot of those balls, both the physical ones and the metaphorical ones. Um, so I, I agree with you. Our kids are watching us all of the time and learning from what we do. And so it matters a lot how we're managing ourselves and managing our stress and sharing that with them. So I think trying to be deliberate about the actions that you're taking and how you're interacting with your kids. I know that when I've had a stressful day, sometimes I can come home and be short with my kids. And it's so much better when I can just take a deep breath, get centered and say, gosh, you know, I've had a rough day. I'm going to go for a run or have a cup of tea or whatnot. And I think that my kids learn from that and learn that that's how they should be responding to. Mm -hmm. and, and modeling those behaviors, it's not only making sure our kids are taking a break, it's making sure us parents are taking a break too. Sure. So um, communicating with teens and young adults is challenging enough sometimes, and especially now. Um, so we have a significant increase in screen time. So how can parents keep the lines of communication open with our kids? Well, I think just really thinking about basics can be helpful. And we like family dinners, uh, don't get to do them a lot at baseline, but we've been doing that a lot more. And my kids actually really enjoy it. It's time for week where we can share with each other about our days and um, engage together and learn from one another. My daughter also asked me to mention that it's important for kids to have their own space too, so that they want to come and come back together and share. If I'm constantly, um, you know, bugging her or whatnot, then she doesn't want to come and have those family dinners and share time together. So time together and time apart. And then um, when your kids do come to you, it's really critical to close your computer, turn the TV off, turn your full attention toward them. So you're able to sit there with them listen to them. You don't have to even say a lot, but listen and be present, validate their feelings. And so that it, that helps them and they want to come to you with more things in the future. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that as kids get older, seventh grade and up, um, it's a different type of communication. It begins with allowing for some negotiation, really helping listening to your, your child's point of view taking time to um, consider their perspective and be non-judgmental. And I think giving ourselves as parents time to respond, you, you know, when our ch children are younger, we might say, you know, they come to us, can I have, I would like, and absolutely not might be our first um, inclination, but maybe um, a, a different reframe. You know, I'm, that sounds really important. I'm gonna think about that and get back to you. Thanks for sharing. I, I really wanna take some time to think about that because I can hear that it's so important to you. I think what you said and what Kim said as well about validating their feelings, I think that's very important at a time like this. Um, so now a lot of our kids are remote learning. Um, how can we tell if they're you know, really struggling with it, if we're busy working and they're busy doing their thing? How do we know if they're really struggling with remote learning so we can help? Yeah, oftentimes our kids will show us with their behavior um, if they're struggling. Um, if kids are feeling anxious or depressed, they might, they might be more irritable or grumpy. Um, they might be isolating more. They might be engaging in more avoiding behavior, um, spending more time online, um, sort of shutting down, um, or they, they might suddenly become more tearful. Um, so I think um, when we're noticing that, um, you know, just again, sort of, asking like, what's going on? I'm, I'm noticing this, but in a very non-judgmental way. Um, for kids who maybe already have existing challenges like ADHD or anxiety, I think that, that you know, there are things about the remote learning um, from home that are already gonna be harder for them. And um, in some ways, we can almost think about this as an opportunity for parents and kids to get to know each other around that part of that child's unique self even, even more deeply. Um, seeing really what it's like for your child as a learner may not be that common for parents as their children grow older. 
Um, so ways that you can help kids, for example, with ADHD is, is to help them manage and plan their time using um, tools like timers and clocks, strategies like chunking things into small bits, taking frequent active breaks, learning how to reflect upon how things are going, you know, whether or not your energy, lag, you know, energy level is flagging. I think um, that uh, I think a lot about, in addition to the emotional pieces that Susan talked about, about um, some of the physical things as well. And we can um, still, in many schools, monitor grades and assignments and things like that. And I would encourage you not to be micromanaging your kids at these times, um, but, but do check in and see where they are and where they might be struggling. Kids in this age group sometimes have difficulty in reaching out to adults for help or knowing how to do that. And and so helping them to think about how they might craft an email to their teacher or what words they might use when they, they initiate that ask for help um, so that they can get what they need. I think it's also to, important to remember that parents are not supposed to be teachers. Your job is not to teach them all of this content. And I feel like so many of us kind of have taken that on because we want our kids to be able to learn and thrive. Um, but that's, that's not the job you have to do. Your job is to support them and help them to reach out for help when they need it. And know that when school's back in session, their teachers will really be there to support them um, and help them to catch up on whatever might have been missed. And I'm sure their teachers are missing them as much as the kids are missing their teachers. So it'll be great when they do get back. So we have a viewer question that came in from our email, which is social at Hitchcock.org. And this is from a parent of, she has children who are older, high school and college. She wants to know, especially for older ones that can drive and are used to having a bit more freedom, should we let them have that space to go for drives or for hikes or send them out to local errands so they can get out of the house briefly with precautions? Um, they feel like they're being punished rather than knowing that we're keeping them healthy and safe. What advice do you have for that parent? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, and I think, you know, ones that are even on our own minds, should I go out? Um, and then even more of that, should I let my kids go out? I would say a definite yes. Um, you know, going back to Susan's advice about having some negotiation around that, maybe talking, you know, and reiterating, maybe having them articulate what the social distancing guidelines are and why they're there. I think it's important to think about um, if you have someone in your house that may be elderly or immune compromised and just really talk about that person's health. Um, but by saying yes to your kids with things like this, um, it can actually help to build trust and to build that relationship with them over time. And that's an important part of that relationship. And so, um, so while we, we do want to be safe and they certainly don't want to do things against the guidelines, I know I, some of my daughter's friends actually are hanging out together in groups, I would certainly discourage that type of behavior. Um, but just being able to connect um, in, in some way with the world outside them can be really important. Yes, and to add to that, you know, some of our older children who are, you know, older high school students or who have gone off to college are really used to engaging in a lot of problem solving and making these kinds of decisions and, and interacting with a very social world. And, um, and they really do have that wisdom about themselves and, um, and to, to be able to continue to, to feel that sort of capability um, and agency is really important for all people including our adult children. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who have kids that aren't quite ready to drive yet, get out on a bike, go out in your neighborhood if you can and just and get outside. I think that would be great as well. So we have another viewer question that came in about um, teens and young adults. How can they stay connected with their peers at this time? That's a really good question. Um, of course, we know that, that um, this age group is really comfortable with using technology to stay connected. Um, and um, so they're very proficient at doing that with um, a variety of different platforms. Um, I, I suspect that, you know, with, with the learning at home that's going on, that, that some actually may be getting a little tired of, um, of being online and staying connected in that way. And um, it, it might be a really interesting um, time to be talking about other ways of staying connected. Um, maybe, you know, sort of for those who still have a traditional landline or, um, you know, <laughs> writing stuff down to share and, and figuring out a way to um, get that information relayed, um, getting a little bit creative about it um, might, be, might be helpful. 
I love those ideas, Susan. My kids have actually sent some letters um, and we had to, you know, review the principles of how you put, where you put the stamp and all of those things because it's just not done so much anymore. Um, but I actually think that I, I, I like social media right now. I have in the past lamented how much gadget time my kids have and tried to put some limits around that. But I've libera liberated that a little bit so that they have more time um, and have, we, it's the same as their, if they were sitting with their friends at lunch or chatting before sports. And so being able to give them some time to do those things, um, I felt was important. But you also want to make sure that it's safe. And so having some kind of oversight over our conversations with your children about how they're engaging. So that if something that's actually harmful to them or to someone else is happening, that you're aware of it and can help them problem solve how to address it. Um, and I, I love your idea, Susan, about um, you know, different ways to engage. I think there are some kids who maybe aren't engaging as much right now, and maybe what they need from their parents is a little bit of encouragement um, or permission to be able to, um, to engage in whatever way they're able to come up with. Absolutely. And I think for parents, you know, staying um, non judgmental and enthusiastic mm -hmm. about our children's peers is so important. And it's another way that we keep our kids safe so that when problems do come up, they feel that they, they can turn to us, they can communicate with us about the problems without worrying that, that we're gonna come to some kind of a conclusion, be overly emotional or judgmental or controlling and shut it down. That's well said. Yep, excellent advice. So before we wrap up, um, could you both share one or two key points that you want parents to remember? Sure, you know, I think that when parents and kids have a lot on their plates, it's easy to get focused on being productive ourselves or to worry that it's also our jobs to make our kids productive. And then we can feel upset when we don't know how to make it all happen. So that can really result in a lot of frustration and anger and disappointment. So I think it's a great time for parents and kids to slow down together and, and just practice, you know, that the term mindfulness, which is really about taking a few moments to be rather than to do. Yeah, I think my take homes are kind of similar. I like to lower my own expectations for myself and for my children right. and really practice adaptability and then just make time to connect, to listen, to appreciate each other and just be present together. Excellent advice. This has been very informative. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you, Audra. Thank you, Audra. So next week, I'll be joined by former New Hampshire Chief Justice and DH Senior Director of External Affairs, John Broderick, and two New Hampshire high school students who will discuss concerns and issues that students may be facing. For the full Heads Up Coping Through COVID-19 webinar series and schedule and additional information and resources, please go to go.d-h.org slash heads up. Like Kim just said, let's make sure we make time to connect, appreciate, and just be present. Have a great day.